so as I said, the Genocide Convention is still the most important document uh, when we're discussing genocide today, even though it's 1948. Um, so we have to look at the Genocide Convention to understand what the elements of the crimes are. And this is what I'm going to consider now. So first, before I go into some detail, I just want to be clear what I mean by elements of the crime. This is just basic criminal law. I just want to make sure everyone is um, on the same page with that. So what are, what are elements of crimes? The idea of elements of crimes is that you need some specificity about a crime in order to respect the rights of defense and the principle of legality. Uh, you need to be very specific of what does a crime mean exactly. So, what you have in a crime, you have two main elements. You have a intention, what is called in Latin the mens rea, and you have the act itself, the actus reus. That in, in any domestic system, you'll have those two elements. So, you know, to take a simple example, if I take a gun and shoot you, the mens rea would be my intention to kill you, the actus reus would be me pulling the trigger, and when you combine the two, you have murder as a crime. It's a combination of a mens rea and actus reus. So that's the basic structure of any crime in domestic law. You probably know all that, but I thought I'd just mention it in, just in case. In the case of international crimes, you have an extra element called the contextual element, which I'm going to discuss in a little second. <clears throat> so, um, what is the, mens, the actus reus, so the material element of genocide? So, Article 2 lists a number of acts um, which can be considered genocide. And I'll just read it out so that you have it in mind for the sake of our discussion. In the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. And then you have five categories of acts. So killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent birth within the group, and forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. So these are the five types of acts which you can uh, look at. So all these conditions need to be discussed briefly. And I'm going to do that now. So what is a group? What are the protected groups in the Genocide Convention? So what you have is four groups. As I said, national, ethnical, racial, or religious. One question is, is that a closed list or an open list? And generally, it's considered to be a closed list. So, you know, once you're, you have to be in one of those four groups to be a protected group. What you will notice is that political groups or social groups are not included, which is a change from what I read you from the General Assembly Resolution from 1946, which he actually said political groups. So here in the convention itself, political groups are not included. The reason why this is there is not very noble. Um, it's the USSR at the time who wanted to exclude it. Because this, the USSR is targeting of groups was mostly on a political basis. So it was excluded for those reasons. Which means that some 
events that we consider as genocide in our daily lives might not actually be genocides, like the Cambodian genocide. And you might be familiar with this, but between 1975 and 1979, a quarter of the Cambodian population was killed by the Khmer Rouge. But it was mostly on political grounds, rather than religious or ethnical grounds. So what is arguably one of the biggest massacres after the Second World War might not be a genocide, based on that definition. So once you say what's, include, what's excluded in that way, you have to say, what is an ethnical, racial, religious, or national group? How do you identify that? You know, is any group um, that considers itself to be a religious group enough? So if I start a religion tomorrow of people wearing glasses, is that, is that a religious group protected by the Genocide Convention? Or must there be something more permanent objective? And that's a debate we've been in for the past 60 years, really, uh, because you have the two approaches. So the first approach that you could find was the objective approach. And I quote from the Akayesu judgment at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, which said that the group is a constituted in a permanent fashion and membership of which is determined by birth with the exclusion of the more mobile groups, which one joins through individual voluntary commitment, such as political and economic groups. Therefore, a common criterion in the four types of groups protected is that membership would seem to be normally not challengeable by its members, who belong to it automatically by birth in a continuous and often irremediable manner. So here you have a very objective approach. You know, yeah, that you're part of a particular ethnicity in Africa, or whether you're Jewish, or Muslim, or Arab, that's something which is objective. You become it by birth, you don't get to choose, and that was the initial definition. But not all judges approach things in this way. So, for example, in another dis judgment, Rutakanda, R-U-T-A-G-A-N-D-A, -A -A, in 1999, and I quote, the chamber notes that the concepts of national, ethnical, racial, and religious groups have been researched extensively and that there is no generally and internationally accepted precise definitions of them. Each of these concepts must be assessed in light of a particular political, social, and cultural context. For the purposes of applying the Genocide Convention, membership of a group is in essence a subjective rather than an objective concept. The victim is perceived by the perpetrator of genocide as belonging to a group, slated for destruction. destruction sorry. In some instances, the victim may perceive himself, herself, as belonging to the said group. So here you have a very subjective approach. Now the victim considers himself as part of a group, or the perpetrator subjectively puts you in a group. You don't have to prove a kind of objective permanence. The reality of the case law, I just took two extreme examples, is somewhere in the middle. Is that the idea of a group is both objective and subjective. So what the chambers are usually looking for, and the judges, is some form of balance. You can't just have this random, spontaneous construction of a group like I said, people wearing glasses. Um, you can't have that. That would not be a protected group. But you can have some flexibility about the perception of the victims and perception of the perpetrators. And you can see a certain number of examples of that in the history of the tribunals. So for example, in Sudan, um, where there, is, there are allegations of genocide being committed there are three ethnic groups which are identified, but also a distinction, distinction between African and Arabs. So you have an overlapping and complex web of um, 
groups are possible ethnicities. A lot of fluctuation between the groups, people moving from one group to another. Um, it's, it, that still allowed the chamber to say this to some permanence, those groups didn't just appear today. And even though there is flexibility between one group and another, we can still say that targeting those groups is genocide or possibly genocide. Another example is Rwanda. So again, I don't know how familiar you are with that, but in 1994 there was a genocide in Rwanda um, and between the Hutus and the Tutsis, so the Hutus, extremist Hutus, killed 800,000 Tutsis in a few months. But when you look at the history of, um, of Rwanda and the role of Belgium as a colonizer, it seems that before Belgium arrived, it wasn't that clear who was Utu Tutsi. It wasn't that um, permanent or crystallized that there were really two ethnicities which were different. What the Belgian, Belgians did when they arrived is that they issued passports with an ethnicity written on the passport. And they relied on the what they perceived as a Tutsi minority to rule. So they gave positions of power, they gave administrative positions uh, to the Tutsis, which created resentment among the Hutus over 30 years and led to what led to the genocide. So there was fluctuation. It's essentially the fault of the colonizer in this case. But the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda said when the genocide occurred, it had become a reality, those two ethnicities. That the fact that people were arrested in the street as to show their ID card with their ethnicity was sufficient to say that there was a protected group. And that was sufficient for the court. Now, it's a really difficult philosophical question, um, if you're interested in this, is that how do you build your own identity? You know, do you have, do you build your own identity alone in a corner, just looking at yourself? Or is your identity built by the reaction of others? I am perceived as being something, so therefore I am something. I don't know if you're familiar with the French philosopher um, Jean-Paul Sartre. That's essentially his idea of existentialism, that I am what the other person says. It's a look, le regard de l'autre, the look of the other which defines me. So that's a complex discussion that law is trying to understand, but it's, it goes beyond a legal discussion. Another important philosophical aspect here is that by protecting groups we are recognizing, we are um, essentializing a people and their qualities. So we're saying the Tutsis are like this and they're a protected group. The Hutus are like this and they're a protected group. The Jews are like this and they're a protected group, etc that you're creating the conditions of racism. You're doing the same, in a way, you're doing the same as a lawyer as what the person who commits genocide does. He's seeing a group as a group. So there is a tension here. You know, we're trying to protect diversity as a value, but we are creating the conditions for racism by essentializing human groups. So it's a, it's a really complex discussion here um, in relation to genocide and it goes beyond our lecture. I thought you should you know, have this in mind that things are not that simple. I just want to say two more things about the actus res before we have a break. Um, it's you know that the killing of members of the group must be intentional. It can't just be a random act. So you had um, you had a, dis a discussion between the English and French texts of the convention. So the English says killing, and the French says meurtre, which is murder. So murder implies this idea of um, of an intention to kill. So that's one thing which is important. Also linked to that is the idea that you don't have any cultural genocide. 
it has to be physical destruction. Again, this is a hotly debated issue, um, but it's not as as such an element of the crime. It can be a part of the definition of um, uh, to see the intent. So, for example, if you have a, if you start destroying religious sites, cultural sites, this can be proof of your intent. You you're not just killing people; you're killing people because of their religion. So, if you're targeting um, Muslims in India, then the fact that you're also destroying the mosques that shows that your intent is not just to kill people, it's to kill Muslims, because you're also targeting their religious um, buildings. So that's where it comes in. But just destroying the religious buildings or cultural heritage is not in itself genocide. The second clarification is, what does causing bodily harm or mental harm mean? So one, the harm doesn't have to be permanent. And there's been a lot of case law on you know, explaining what it means to cause bodily harm or mental harm. Now, I mention this because you can see the ambiguity here. You know, how does causing harm relate to the intent to destroy a group? I mean, killing is one thing, preventing births is another, creating conditions of life which bring deaths is another, but injuring someone, there seems to be a contradiction here. And when I say injure, I mean intend to injure, not attempted murder. You know, if you try to kill someone and you don't actually succeed, that's still murder, attempted murder. I'm talking here about intent to just injure. I've always been puzzled by that, how that relates to um, the, the intention to kill. One example of that would, is the recognition that rape and sexual violence could be genocide. This was accepted in 1998 by the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. And again, on the one hand, it's a very important development because this is not the topic of our lecture, but sexual violence against women has often been ignored by international criminal lawyers. So it's a very positive thing that you know, rape is taken into account by international tribunals. But on the other hand, I fail to see how rape shows an intent to destroy a group. So there is, there is ambiguity there in you know, how injury falls into genocide. Um, so now that we've dealt with uh, actus reus of the crime, so what you actually have to do, uh, we move on to a difficult issue of mens rea, which is the intention. Um, so this is the most difficult part, as we're going to see now, of genocide. It's usually easy to prove that a group is targeted or a group is being killed. It's much harder to prove that there is an intention to kill that group. So our starting point is again Article 2 of the Genocide Convention, which says that you have to have an intent to destroy in whole or in part um, the national, ethnic, religious, or racial group. So what does that mean? Now what you have to understand, as I said before, is that intent is fundamental in criminal law. And as I showed you with the example I gave before, it's usually quite straightforward that I shoot you with the intent to kill you. So there is a direct link between you know, the act, the act of shooting, and the intent to shoot. Um, the difference in genocide, which you have to take in mind, is that there is this, what is called a specific intent. Not only must you have the intent to do whatever I listed before, so killing, injuring, etc., but you have to have the specific intent to target them because they are part of a group. So you have two intents in genocide. Intent to kill, intent to kill because they are part of a group. Now that's quite a novel idea. Generally, criminal law doesn't care about motive, because that's what essentially what that is. So if I shoot someone because 
I want to take their wallet, if I shoot someone for no reason, if I shoot someone because I don't like their, the color of their hair, that doesn't change the definition of murder. It's still a murder. The fact that I shot them for different motives does not change that. Genocide, it's key. It's the most important point. This specific intent, this motive. Interestingly, it's not the only specific intent crime in international law, and I'm sure you're going to have lectures on that, if not already, but terrorism, for example, is clearly an example of a specific intent crime. Not only do you cause deaths to civilians, for example, but you cause deaths to civilians in order to spread terror or in order to obtain a political advantage. So this is, you know, terrorism is another example um, of, a, of a motive crime. So given that, how do we establish intent? There are two points I want to discuss particularly. Now, of course, you can have straightforward evidence. You know, you can have a document signed by, and this is what happened mostly with uh, the Holocaust. You had German documents saying, you know, we're targeting the Jews. But this is pretty straightforward. You have enough evidence to infer intent. But one difficulty is, what about knowledge? Is knowledge sufficient, or do you need to show intent? And I hope you see the difference between knowledge and intent. You, know, you can do something with the knowledge that something might occur. So you can kill someone with the knowledge that they're from an ethnic minority, but not have the intent to kill them because they're of the ethnic minority. So normally there's a very strong distinction between knowledge and intent. What happens in international criminal law is that the line is blurred often in a lot of cases, and I don't have time to go into too many details here, but knowledge, intent is inferred from knowledge. That because we established that someone knew, we established that someone intended to do something. Now I'll give you a, a case scenario. Let's imagine um, uh, a head of a camp, military camp in Rwanda in 1994. There is a, uh, there is a, it's a Hutu military camp, and within the camp there is a family of Tutsis, and they're safe in that camp. But let's imagine for whatever reason that the commander of the camp expels them, saying you have no place being in a military camp, we're sending you out of the camp. And he does that with the knowledge that if they're out on the road, they'd probably be killed. The guy doesn't care and he expels them from the camp. Now, morally, we can say that this is not nice. But it's not the same as intention. He doesn't want them to die, he just doesn't care if they do. But at the ICTR, this case was considered to be intent. The knowledge that they would die, and their certain deaths, was considered to be sufficient for the guy to have intent to kill them. So you can see where it's you know, quite flexible as a definition. A second difficulty about intent is, as you recall from what I said, Article 2 says that you have the intent to destroy in whole or in part a group. What does that mean? You know, what geographical region do we look at, for example? Must it be the whole world? in a particular region, in a state, in an occupied land, in a city? You know, how, what is our parameter? What is our geographical box that we're looking at? But the question is not very clear. The answer is not very clear. This arose in the case in Bosnia. So again, I don't know if you've heard of Srebrenica, which is uh, the only occasion where genocide was found to have occurred. Um, in the former Yugoslavia. So Srebrenica is a town in Bosnia, which in July 1995 um, was surrounded. All the men were taken from the city, were shot, and all the women and children were expelled. And this was considered to be a genocide. Now one problem that arose is 
there was no evidence of a genocidal intent on the rest of the territory. That's what the court says so far. So you have the same group of people who occupy a whole territory. You cannot prove that they have a genocidal intent throughout the territory, but you can still say that they had genocidal intent in one town, which is what they did with Srebrenica. So you can see the problem here. You know, if they have a genocidal intent, why don't they apply it on the whole territory they control? So the fact that they're not applying it everywhere, isn't that proof that they don't have genocidal intent? If you have questions on that, we can go through it um, in the Q&A, but it's, it's quite a difficult issue. Right, so now we did the two most important things, which are um, the actus res, so the, how you commit a crime, and the mens rea. I won't spend any time on the modes of liability, uh, because essentially the idea of conspiracy or attempt, etc., there's nothing specific about genocide, and I think you have lectures on modes of liability, so um, you can deal with that there. I prefer to move on to something more important, which is the collective element of the crime. So one thing you sh should be aware of is that, obviously, international crimes are not the same as domestic crimes. No, they all have a collective nature. Um, they have to be widespread, systematic, and you know, they're often decided by a government or by a armed group. You know, it's not one single event. So the essential question here is that, can one person commit a genocide? You know, if I go out in the street now and start shooting a few people from an ethnic group, is that a genocide? There are really two approaches to this. One, set, one approach is to say that the Genocide Convention does not say anything. If you look at the Genocide Convention, there is no explicit requirement that you would need an organization or a state policy so that a single individual can commit a genocide. The second approach is to say that that's not the nature of genocide. The crime of genocide was not created to cover single instances of murder for religious motives. It was really created when one group is trying to destroy another group. So between those two logics, uh, we have to decide, and the courts have to decide. Now, if you take the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, the ICTY, uh, it said that it's not a requirement of the crime. You don't have to show an organizational policy, a state policy, a state plan. One single individual can commit a genocide. Now, it doesn't mean that the state policy is not taken into account to show the intention again. You know, it can be proof. If you can show that there is a state policy, it's likely that the state agent is acting with the intention to um, enforce that policy. But it's not an element of the crime. <clears throat> In the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, things are a bit different. It doesn't really say that you need a state policy, but the elements of the crimes says that you need uh, to show that the conduct took place in the context of a manifest pattern of similar conduct directed against that group, or was conduct that could itself affect such destruction. So you have this idea of manifest pattern of similar conduct. Again, it's not explicitly um, a, a state plan or policy, but you have to show some you know, regularity and some pattern. When the second part of the sentence is more ambiguous, that could itself affect such destruction. Now, it's difficult to know what the drafters had in mind, uh, but clearly this means when you use, for example, a nuclear weapon or weapons of mass destruction generally. So a single person with a very big weapon 
could possibly commit a genocide if the conduct could itself achieve such destruction. So it's not entirely clear you know, what is which, but if you look at the case law so far, it seems to go in the direction of a policy. So it's, it's really, um, you know, again, uh, not a philosophical discussion, but it, it relates to our understanding of what genocide is. You know, I personally think that it makes no sense to think that one person commits a genocide. It's a murder with religious intent, but that's not what the term was invented for. And in fact, when you look at uh, how Lemkin, who invented the term, wrote about it, he clearly saw the idea of one group destroying another group and replacing it, imposing its culture, imposing its way of thinking, imposing its politics. This is how the term was understood by Lemkin, and it should be understood in my view. Um, I think that's a really important point. But you should be aware that the Genocide Convention does not take sides, and so it's still debated today, this idea. <laughs>